Are you waiting or witnessing? So Dr. Fred Craddock tells a story of an annual Easter tradition at a church in Georgia. Every year on Easter Sunday, the church was decorated with 500 Easter lilies. The lilies were arranged on the chancel in the shape of a cross. They were all along each window of the church, across the altar rail, even across the baptistry edge. Literally everywhere you looked on Easter morning, there was an Easter lily. Each year, members of the church were given an opportunity to have a lily placed in honor or memory of a loved one for a contribution of just $5. Yeah, $5. And then you didn't have to even take it home after the service. The church would dispose of them, and everyone just assumed that all of these lilies went to shut-ins or people in the hospital. So, So this went on year after year until one Easter Sunday after the worship service. A dear, sweet lady went back into the sanctuary after church. I have an aunt who is in the nursing home, she said, so if you don't mind, I'm going to take my lily to her. I'll just pick one out. And she goes over to the nearest window, grabs the first one she sees, and in a voice loud enough to be heard from the church parking lot, she screamed, oh my God, it's plastic. (laughs) People rushed in. And they began looking at all the Easter lilies, only to discover that every last one of them was plastic. There was a call deacon board meeting the next night. The pastor and the chairman of the deacons felt as if they were facing a firing squad, as one church member after another shot them questions like, well, just how long has this been going on? Where do you even hide 500 plastic Easter lilies? And especially, what happened to all those $5 donations? Well, the chairman tried to explain that the money had had not been used for dishonest purposes. Each year, half the money was put into the uh, general fund of the church. The other half was sent to the denominational office and used for missions work in Africa, South America, and other places around the world. And the pastor chimed in and said, yes, And do you know what usually happens with real Easter lilies after the Easter Sunday service? Most people take them home, water them, all the blooms fall off, and then they just throw them away. We just thought that was a terrible waste, and you wouldn't want to waste Easter, do you? Although I'd much rather have live flowers than fake ones. There was something to this story that matters for this morning as we are in the last day of the Easter season. Because did you hear it? In the story it says, it is a terrible thing to waste Easter. And that's what the disciples were doing on this Ascension Day. They were wasting Easter. They were wasting the power of Jesus, the power to heal and to include and to love and to change lives. They were wasting the power of witnessing to the way of Jesus to others. They were wasting the power of being a resurrection people. The disciples had become a waiting people, not a witnessing people. Witnesses to the power of Jesus' spirit to change the world. So as I previously said, we're in the seventh Sunday of Easter, last Sunday of Easter tide, before we move into Pentecost Sunday next week and the whole Pentecost season. And so since it's been seven weeks, it's been seven weeks since Easter. Can you believe that much? It's been seven weeks since we've filled this sanctuary with the symbols and the vibrancy of resurrection. It's been seven weeks since we've filled the chancel with flowers and lilies. Yes, the live ones. The lively energy of our children as they got all dressed up in their Easter best and were very energetic with all the candy in their stomachs. 
The buoyant and sturdy music meant to proclaim the vitality of Christ's resurrection, the excitement of renewed energy to go out into the world as Easter people. All that energy feels gone now, doesn't it? It feels as if we're waiting for something, waiting for that next blaze of the Holy Spirit energy, Pentecost, to come and enliven our souls. We're weary and waiting, looking up into heaven, hoping for the tongues of fire to flicker on our foreheads. We've been waiting so long, and I know we're tired. We're tired with life, tired with hurting, tired of being bullied, tired of mean tweets and Facebook posts and letters. We're tired of rumors of wars and wars. We're tired of mass shootings. We are tired and we're feeling helpless, like there's nothing we can do but give in to the frustrations and the evil in the world. We are tired of waiting. And so we look up, come Jesus, come back as you promised you would. We are waiting, looking up, eager for your presence, eager for your spirit to reignite our souls. Come Jesus, where are you? This brief time between Ascension and Pentecost was designated by Karl Barth as a significant pause between the mighty acts of God, a pause in which it was the church's task to, to wait and to pray. And so we get to this seventh Sunday of Easter, between Easter and Pentecost, and in a time of expectant waiting for the spirits. And yes, it feels like we're waiting. We're waiting for things to get better we're waiting for a change in leadership. We're waiting for an illness to heal. We're waiting for that paycheck to be deposited. We're waiting. We're waiting. And even though we're waiting, the Spirit of God is out ahead of us in the world. But the power we have in the Spirit and the knowledge we have of the life-changing work of Christ and the hope we have in the resurrection demands something of us. Demands that we be witnesses in the world. Which is why they needed a little bit of help. Did you see the, dis the angels that came to those disgruntled disciples who were waiting? And they said, why do you stand looking into heaven? There is work to be done. Don't just look into heaven. Bring heaven to the world. Help the church to do the work of resurrection and salvation. It isn't by waiting that Jesus will come. It is by going out and being Jesus to the world, by bringing life from death, by bringing healing from illness, by bringing hope from suffering, by bringing love from animosity. It is up to you to stop waiting and to start witnessing to Christ's spirit in the world. And I'm sure the disciples felt like us, I'm sure they struggled with the absence of Jesus and the absence of hope. I'm sure the followers felt like us as they gawked and they gazed up into heaven, watching Jesus going away. So in the text, it says the disciples were a stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked people. That's exactly, literally what it means. They were looking up. As they gaze into heaven, looking after the ascended Jesus, but the messengers who came to the disciples told them that they would not receive the Holy Spirit until they were witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all the earth. The power to change the world would only happen as soon as they stopped looking up into heaven and started looking into the eyes of those in the world who needed the good news. The disciples were to stop looking up into heaven and to start bringing 
heaven to all people. Richard M. Landers in the Feasting on the Word commentary says, Ascensions and moments of divine encounter can dazzle us so that we forget the surrounding world. We glory in the moment only to find out that God has moved on and so must we. And I know it feels as if there is a distance between us and Jesus in this post-Easter season. The disciples, they felt lost and abandoned and afraid, and so do we. We peek into heaven hoping for some type of outstretched hand of help. But we must move through our grief and our fear and serve the living Christ who has ascended. Emily Dickinson wrote in one of her poems, At least to pray is left, is left, O Jesus, in the air. I know not which thy chamber is. I'm knocking everywhere. And the disciples stood there waiting, staring until Jesus was out of sight, knocking on heaven's door, hoping that Jesus would change his mind and come back to earth and finish what he had begun. You know, I can imagine those disciples standing there with mouths agape, running through the scenarios in their heads about how what they had longed for, what they were waiting for, for Jesus to overthrow the powers of that world, usher in a new reality where God's chosen were in charge. They wanted him back. They wanted his passion. They wanted his spirit. They wanted his fire. They wanted his purpose. They wanted everything that God had promised, and they were disheartened that it ended like this. They didn't want to move from that spot until Jesus came. But the angels knew better. They knew those disciples needed that push. The angels knew that these abandoned followers had a job to do. And that job wasn't simply looking up into the sky. Pentecost was coming. And the power of the Holy Spirit was about to set fire to the world. And if the disciples had chosen not to witness to that power, then the Pentecost world would never have come into being. The angels needed to push those petrified followers out into the world to bring Pentecost to the people. The time for waiting was over. The time for witnessing had begun. And the excitement of the first Easter had died down. And the angels had pressed the disciples to bring the Spirit's fire into the world. So what were they to do now? What's next? They were to stop waiting and be witnesses of God's work. They were to talk about and share the story of Jesus and how he brought God's realm to the hurting world. They were to share the sacrament, the bread and the cup with all those who were eager and hungry for faith. They were to share the waters of baptism with those who were needed to be immersed in God's love, they were to baptize with fire of the Spirit. With those who were frigid with fear, they were to witness and witness with power. And that's what we are supposed to do today, church. Even though the excitement of Easter has died down, we must not wait until the next Easter to roll around again on the calendar. We must not skip over Pentecost. We must hear Jesus' last command to the disciples. Did you hear it in the text? We need to be witnesses to people of all nations, into Jerusalem, Judea, all the earth. We need to share about the inclusive and healing and reconciling and empowering love of Christ. We are called to be witnesses, church. And 
It doesn't have to be complicated or confusing. We simply have to tell the story of our lives and how Jesus has changed us. All we have to do is simply show through our actions that God is a God of love and acceptance. All we simply have to do is be persons of goodwill who call all people to God's table. The absence of the earthly Jesus beckons to us to search for God who is already present in the world. We need to look for the movement of God, not just up in the clouds, but in the faiths and faces of all of God's people. We need to relinquish our expectations of how God will move and follow the Spirit out into this upside-down world. We need to stop waiting and go out and share the surging Spirit of resurrection. We must be witnesses. Is that you this morning? Are you ready to encourage the people in Dallas to, who need to feel the love of Christ, who need the power of the Spirit, who needs the Easter message and the hope and resurrection that their lives matter and that they can impact the world too? The Spirit is about to come upon us next week. And it will be time to get to work. Because we wouldn't want to waste Easter, would we? Are we witnessing or are we waiting? Amen.